We have had the privilege to hear from some world-renowned scholars and some of the uh, most famous lecturers anywhere. We've heard everyone from D.A. Carson to Judge uh, Supreme Court Justice Anton Scalia, but we haven't been any more excited or had any greater anticipation than we have for tonight's lecture from tonight's special guest lecturer, world-renowned scholar, speaker. Aw, <laughs> oh, shucks. That's what he says. <clears throat> I, I just really, I, I just want to express, I, I know everybody's smiling and feeling exactly what I'm trying to say, how grateful we are to Mark and Becky and the family for having us in their backyard tonight and uh, sharing this great, great library, chapel. We really, really are grateful. Let's go to the Lord and thank our Father. Father, we are grateful for the privilege to be here tonight. It's just a blessing to make ourselves available to this kind of environment, atmosphere, this kind of community, this kind of experience. We've been challenged here many times. We've learned so much in this process. We're so grateful that you have made this available. We thank you for Mark and Becky and their family, for those who have worked so hard to put this together and to put all of these lectures out and make them available for us. And we especially thank you for tonight. I'm grateful for Mark's investment in my life and the life of all of these and so many more, his ministry to us and your hand and your anointing and your wisdom in and through his life. And this book, Lord, has just been such a powerful, powerful tool. And I thank you for it. Pray you'll bless it. Pray, Lord, that tonight just will be another great step towards pushing this book out and using it in the hearts and lives of people to strengthen their faith and, and to challenge them to think about the reasonableness of their faith. We're grateful for Jesus, for your presence here tonight. And we know that while we will always be stimulated academically and intellectually, we want to be moved spiritually tonight. Amen. We want to come closer to you. We want to know you better. We want to walk more closely with Jesus. And we say, Lord, have your way tonight. Bless Mark as he shares, as he speaks, Lord. Just uh, let your anointing rest on him, give him power to speak truth into our hearts and lives. And we open our minds and our hearts to you and to truth. And we want to learn something tonight about you. Bless this meeting and the presentation and thank you for the family, the Lear family. We ask a blessing over them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Well, I'm John Michael. I'm glad to be here. How many of you have ever heard my music? Anybody? Glad both of you have. Great. Okay. Now, I have a new TV show called All Things Are Possible With God. Say that with me. All Things Are Possible With God. I know. I thought Protestants would be like better than Catholics. Come on. All Things Are Possible With there you go. Well, here's the deal. Look at this. Mark told me that my music helped get him through law school. <laughs> and he went from being, he was going to be ordained a Church of Christ minister, then he became a lawyer, and now he's written this wonderful book, Christianity on Trial. See, all things are possible with God. And <laughs> See? All right. Now, I asked Mark what he wanted me to sing tonight. And uh, he asked me to sing Healer of My Soul. It actually wouldn't have been my choice, but I want to do it. I think it's appropriate because as Pastor just prayed with us, you know, the mind is good, but the mind leads us to the heart to have a personal love relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, Pope Francis just did the joy of the gospel. Listen to what he said right at the beginning. I challenge all Christians, that's us, everywhere... That's even in the library. At this very moment, wow, right now, to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. So as I sing this, I invite you to let Jesus heal your soul, prepare the way so that Mark, when he speaks, that those words will fall on good soil. Amen? Amen. All right. Can you all hear okay? All right. Well, this comes from the ninth century. It's a Celtic prayer, kind of late in Celtic history. It's called Healer of My Soul. I found it in an old uh, Celtic prayer book. As I sing it, I'm going to ask you to sit straight, put your feet flat on the floor if you can reach it. Rest your hands out on your laps. Open them up. Open your hands up facing like that there so that we will be open to whatever Jesus has for us this very night healer of my
our need for healing tonight. Let's open ourselves completely to it. I'm going to ask you to join and sing that if you know it. If you don't, I'll sing anyway. St. John Chrysostom and St. Augustine said in the early cathedrals there in the early church, they sang even when they didn't know the words. They called it singing in the Spirit. So sing with me. Just a second. Let the Spirit of God anoint us right now. Amen. All right. Join me in saying thank you to John Michael for that. Oh. Healer of my soul. Well, my dear friends, we have a treat because America's very best trial lawyer, not one of the top, the very best. There's Hertz, there's Avis, there's rent a -Rec. We've got Hertz Plus here with Mark Lanier. We're... That's great. Healer Hoff. No, wait, that's him. This gathering, are you glad to be here? Amen. Is being streamed, and that means live, to the beautiful hills of Tennessee, to Nashville, Tennessee, to a great university. Lipscomb University. Let's hear it from all the Lipscomb people. Whoa. Now, I was going to lay claim to this campus for Baylor University, but they straightened me out right away. They said, this is our proud alumnus, and I don't blame you for being proud. Because from my perspective, it all began in 1984. I was a walk-on scrubby judge, and did you just tell me to sit down and be quiet? Oh, is Ra there's Randy Lowry. Randy, please say hello to everyone. Watch out. Keep. Oh, and he's getting a standing ovation. Well, we're honored to have uh, Randy Lowry uh, here from Lipscomb, and what a magnificent job he is doing at Mark's undergraduate alma mater. I've been told to keep this brief, so I'm just going to tell one story, and I have it with Mark's permission. The year was 1984. I was a scrubby walk-on judge at the finals, yes, the finals of the American Bar Association moot court competition. Moot court means, you know, it's really important, but it's for law students. And this was the end of the trail. Someone had to win and someone had to lose. But at times in the judging business, it's hard. I know there's at least one judge here. It might be really close, but that particular time when we went back in chambers after the arguments, we didn't know who the advocates were. You didn't know the law schools. But we were unanimous in saying the top oral advocate at the end of this national competition is Mark Lanier. Are you surprised that as a law student, he was... As we say in Waco, numero uno. At 
You know I'm bilingual. John Michael, you're from Arkansas. You did not understand that. Now, he has, I assure you from my vantage point as a lawyer, ascended to the very pinnacle of the profession. There is no one who has looked more to than Mark Lanier when the going gets rough. And one of the reasons is he has such a passion for justice, but tonight we're going to hear about this other dimension of Mark Lanier, aren't we? Committed to the faith, the ancient faith, the faith of our fathers, and he has done it brilliantly as America's leading courtroom lawyer to call a remarkable array of witnesses to the stand. And at the end of the day, my dear friends, the jury verdict is in favor of the faith of our fathers and the faith of our mothers. Would you join me in welcoming to his on home, Mark Lanier, America's leading courtroom lawyer, Christianity on trial. Is that okay? Well, I've got to tell you that I'm honored that y'all would be here and that y'all would listen to me. Uh, I, I felt kind of guilty having this library and then inviting myself to speak. So I turned myself down the first three times. But then I was so persistent, I finally said, okay. And uh, 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 no, uh, it is an honor to be here. I want to thank a number of people. Of course, my dear friend, John Michael. Uh, thank you, my brother. He he uh, did this uh, entirely on his own. He asked me, could he please come show some honor and love and respect? And and I, my only hesitancy was that I knew I would be sitting there saying, John Michael, just take my hour. <laughs> I just will sit here and worship and enjoy the Lord with you. Um, thank you, John Michael, very much. Ken, uh, I, I could not ask for a better friend or a more incredible person with truly a foot in the legal world and a foot in the world of biblical studies and Christianity than you. And thank you for coming in from Baylor just to do this introduction tonight. Such a kind and, and dear friend. Uh, go Bears. And then, Randy, <laughs> bison beats a bear every time. Just saying. Um, <clears throat> so as a trial lawyer, one of the things that I do is I, I go into courtrooms around the country. And it is my job to persuade juries to vote the way I believe they should vote. And the only way I can do that, I've learned after 30 years of doing it, is not to ask them to vote for something unless I believe in it. If I ask them to vote for something I don't believe in, I don't sleep well at night, I can't pray about it, I can't believe in it. So the first thing I have to do as a trial lawyer is believe in my case. If I don't, Send Larry to try it. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Larry. I'm going to take it tonight because I believe in this one. So I thought, what can I talk about tonight recognizing who all is going to be here? Many of you have not read the book. Many of you have read the book. And I knew that I'd also have some lawyers here. I'd have some judges here. And I wanted to make sure that I offered something to some of you that haven't read the book and offered something to some of you who have. So I decided to go after chapter 7, morality, right and wrong. Here's the way I approached life. Here's the way I approached the practice of law. Here's the way I approached this trial. I want to take all of the evidence and I want to figure out, much like you do when you're putting together a puzzle, how the pieces properly fit together. When you're putting together a puzzle, it's not just a question of, of uh, gee, does it take three prongs in one hole? Or is this a prong hole, prong hole? 
Those are technical puzzle terms. If you don't know them, that's okay. A lot of people, you know, but we do puzzles. Prong hole, prong hole. That's not enough. The prongs have to be the right size. The holes have to be the right size. The colors have to fit. And if the piece of the puzzle doesn't fit, Johnny Cochran would say, you must acquit, but that was actually a glove. <laughs> if, if, if the puzzle don't fit, you must acquit. If the piece of the puzzle does not fit, then you don't have the right story. When I engage people about issues of faith, I engage them on this question. How well do your puzzle pieces truly fit the world in which we live? How well does your view of reality conform to your life? Do you live consistent with the viewpoints you espouse? See, I was at an age once where I could espouse lots of viewpoints I didn't agree with. I would espouse them sometimes just to get attention. When I was in high school, I said many things just because I thought it was pretty funny and I wanted to see how people reacted. But if you ask me if my life was consistent with what I was saying, it wasn't. Because the way we live conveys what we truly believe, I think. So when I look at the issue of what the world is like, and I try to put together the puzzle of the world, one of the things I'm asking myself is, which puzzle piece fits? What makes the most sense of things? Yeah, I, I, I look at the issue that we're going to look at tonight, which is right and wrong, morality, good and evil. And I want to challenge you and I want to challenge myself, I want to challenge anybody watching this, to fairly and accurately ask that question. Which puzzle piece adequately explains the way life is, the way the world is? What viewpoint of good and evil explains my life around good and evil? If you're not following me, that's okay. We've got some time to talk about it. I've met very few people that would not agree with me that one of the greatest atrocities of humanity is the Holocaust. The rise to power of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich in Germany is an interesting one to read about. He was elected by one vote in the Reichstag. Adolf Hitler, as an elected man, as a Fuhrer, in a new government that was deemed a top-down government, properly came to power and used his power to great, ill, horrendous, horrible, unimaginable destruction and horror. Consider some of the pictures that we can see. The pictures that came out of the Holocaust. Millions upon millions killed in the most inhumane ways possible. And when we look at the photographs, it turns our stomach. There are photographs that were too graphic for me to put in this presentation. I had great hesitancy about what I might put into this presentation and what I might give you. But I will tell you that after the Holocaust was over and the, the Allies won World War II, the decision was made by the top four governments with the support of 17 other governments to put the war criminals on trial and to do so at Nuremberg. Here in Nuremberg where the anti-Jew law was first passed, 
It was converted into a courthouse. And 20 some odd German captured criminals were put to trial. Now, I'll admit I'm a nerd. And what's worse, I'm not just a Bible nerd, I'm a legal nerd. I'm like a double nerd. If you want something to enlighten your mind while it turns your stomach, read some of the testimony from the Nuremberg trial. You can read books about the Nuremberg trial, but you can read the testimony. You can see the documents readily available on the Internet or your local theological library. In the docks were a number of people. I've pulled out four pictures for you to look at. Herman Goring. The cross-examination of Herman Goring is an interesting one to read. Hess, von Ribbentrop, Keitel. They sat and they endured this trial process, but they didn't go to trial immediately. What happened was interesting. Before they went to trial for eight months, the four major governments met together. The United States, Great Britain, France, and, and uh, the USSR. And each sent a prosecuting representative. Justice Robert Jackson from the Supreme Court took a leave of absence from our Supreme Court of the United States of America to be the U.S. prosecutor. And before the trial began, for eight months, these four government-appointed judges, or prosecutors, I should say, met together to try to figure out how they were going to do things. The Russian didn't understand. He said, we do trials all the time in the USSR. It's very easy. You bring in the criminal, he confesses, you take him out and kill him, it takes 10 minutes. <laughs> the French representative wasn't much different because the continental system was very much not that different. But the British government and the U.S. government said, no, no, no. The accused gets a lawyer. There will be a trial. The accused has a right to cross-examine witnesses. The Russian was dumbfounded. He says, you've got to be kidding me. And the Americans said, no. And then they set themselves over the next eight months to the most horrendous chore that they had to do. They had to write the laws that they were going to use to convict the Germans. Now, if I ask you, did the Germans do something wrong? Were they evil? Were they, was it reprehensible? Everyone would raise their hand. But there's a real tension in this world about what right and wrong really is. Because I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to give you my end result now, and then we'll work there together. That the idea that Hitler did something wrong, and that the Third Reich was in error, only works logically. It only fits in the puzzle of someone who believes that there's a God and a moral God at that. And I will tell you, I got to this chapter asking myself this question. If I had been forced... Well, let me take a step back before I ask that. Let me give you some of the atrocities. Here's a write-up from the Columbia Daily Spectator from Otto Ohlendorf. Otto Ohlendorf was a central security officer. And here's what he said about how they went about killing innocents. He said the Einstadt unit, which was the policing unit, would enter a village or town and order the prominent Jewish citizens to call together all Jews for the purpose of, quote, resettlement, 
close quote. They were requested to hand over their valuables and shortly before execution to surrender their outer clothing. They were transported to the place of executions, usually an anti-tank ditch, in trucks. Always, only as many as could be executed immediately. In this way, it was attempted to keep the span of time from the moment in which the victims knew what was about to happen to them until the time of their actual execution. Keep it as short as possible. Then they were shot, kneeling or standing, by firing squads in a military manner and the corpses thrown into the ditch. Now you might think, well, that's pretty accusatory. No. Otto Ohlendorf was one of the ones being tried. His defense was, I was just following orders. Let me give you a different perspective. Let me give you the perspective of German engineer Hermann Graby. And his testimony that I want to give you is a little too long for that, but let me read it to you. This is what he was an eyewitness to. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages had to undress upon the order of an SS man who carried a riding or dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places, sorted according to shoes, top clothing, and underwear. I saw a heap of shoes, about 800 to 1,000 pair. Without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other, said farewells, and waited for a sign from another SS man who stood near the pit. An old woman with snow-white hair was holding a one-year-old child in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing with delight. The parents were looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about 10 years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment, the SS man at the pit shouted something to his comrade. The latter counted off about 20 persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. I remember a girl slim and with black hair, who, as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, 23 years old. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together, lying on top of each other, so only their heads were visible. Some of the people were still moving. I looked for the man who did the shooting. He was an SS man who sat at the edge of the narrow end of the pit, his feet dangling in the pit. He had a Tommy gun on his knees and was smoking a cigarette. I don't know anybody who can read this testimony and not agree that what happened was horrendously wrong. But it was a real struggle for the prosecutors to put together a program to convict these men. So here's what Justice Jackson says in his opening statement. He says, we're going to convict these men, but here's what we're going to convict them of. They took from the German people those dignities and freedoms that we hold natural and inalienable rights in every human being. They excited the German ambition to be a master race. We charge guilt on plan and intended conduct that involves moral as well as legal wrong. It is their abnormal and inhuman conduct which brings them to this bar. To this I ask the question. That works real well if you believe in moral right and wrong. But where does that right and wrong really come from? For Justice Jackson to say it's an inalienable right means someone had to give it to you. An inalienable right is not one given by society. Society could take it away. 
An inalienable right is not one given by a government. The German government authorized everything these people did. It was legal by the laws of Germany. So what do you have and how do you have it? You've got these horrendous wrongs. And yet in the midst of those horrendous wrongs, we ask this question. Were Hitler's actions truly indefensible? Here's how I came to the chapter. If I was forced to defend Hitler, how would I have done so? Now, most everybody says, well, Hitler would have had no defense if he hadn't committed suicide. No defense. And I just want to say, true back then, but you give me the right jury today, and I walk him. I walk every one of them. You give me the right jury today, and I walk them. I've been having an email correspondence with a young exchange student from Eastern Europe who doesn't believe in God, and I've been engaging him in this discussion through emails. I said, so what's right and wrong to you? If there's no God to tell you what's right and wrong, you tell me, how do you decide what's right and wrong? And we've gone through the debate back and forth, and ultimately he's at this point, we're not at the end yet. We've gone through a couple of things where he's had to change his mind. The latest email from him was, whatever saves the most lives is right. To which I have now directed him to Thomas Malthus. A Brit from the end of the 1800s, the end of the 19th century, who when faced with the issue of starvation in Africa and looking for a reason not to send food to Africa, came up with a statistic that said for every life we save today, we're killing 10 people in the future because they're just going to breathe and they'll outstrip food. So if Malthus, if, if my young email friend is right, this is what I told him. I said, so by your ethic... We should let all of the starving people starve and die. That's the good thing to do. And he's got to answer that one. I'll be waiting for it. <laughs> How would I have defended Hitler? You give me the right jury and I would start with Charles Darwin. Now, I'm not here to bash evolutionists. But I would start with Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin wrote on the origin of the species... And Charles Darwin said that we have evolved as a human race from earlier, less, more primitive life forms. And we finally come to be who we are today through this process called natural selection. Among the folks in Darwin's posse, was a British biologist by the name of Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer wrote one of the textbooks on biology. And Herbert Spencer was the one who first coined the phrase survival of the fittest, by which he meant those creatures, those animals, most fit or suited to their environment are the ones that will survive. Those least suited to their environment won't. And in this same thought train, after Spencer, we've taken it now to an area of philosophy when we start dealing with a gentleman by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. And Friedrich Nietzsche takes it further. And he developed this concept that, yes, we are in that chain of evolution, but we are not the final link. We're just another link. And there will come the ubermensch, the overman or the superman, or however you wish to translate it. But there will come a race of people that compared to us, are what we are compared to monkeys. And that's the future of humanity. 
And what we have a responsibility and ethical and moral duty to do is to get that day here sooner than later. Or so Hitler would say. I don't mean to say that Nietzsche would have approved of Hitler's deeds. I don't think he would have at all. At least based on my reading. But I will tell you that he put some phrases out there. Some phrases where he talked about us becoming superhumans. Where he said things like, the human being must become better and more evil. The road to being better is what some would term an evil road. We need to throw away the conventions of right and wrong, of moral and immoral behavior, and recognize that the destiny of the human being is what many people today would term evil activity. And that's a picture that I've thrown in here of Hitler with Nietzsche's sister visiting the Nietzsche archives. There's a lot of anti-Semitic things in Nietzsche's writings that were probably not written by Nietzsche. I don't think he was anti-Semitic. Most scholars don't. They were inserted by later people. But that's not relevant to my discussion. That's not relevant to a defense that I think could be put forward for Hitler. I mean, here's the defense. Think about it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are one link on this evolutionary chain. There's no God. There's nobody out there who's going to mystically say there's right and there's wrong. There's evil and there's good. We're just a bunch of animals. And in the animal kingdom, there are animals that kill their own. And the fittest will survive. Those most suitable for their environment. And the responsible, intelligent, educated person, so the argument would go, is the one who recognizes this and says, I'm going to move us along that road of progress, that, that evolutionary path, as fast as I can. It's the responsible thing to do, to call the human race. To get rid of those we deem genetically inferior. So that the master race, if you will, can continue to breed within itself and propel us to the people we need to be. Don't let anyone disillusion you and hold you back to be the monkey that you are today. Our responsibility to the future is much too great for that. And it takes a man of vision, so the argument would go, to see it. But really what it takes is someone who holds these fundamental ideas as truths. You see, if that's all it is, then we've got an easy explanation for the immorality of Hitler. Hitler. And now you've got Justice Robert Jackson, the U.S. prosecutor, who's having to stand up and say, we're indicting these people, we're going to judge these people, some will get prison terms, some will be shot, and we're going to do it because what they did was violate laws that we all just feel within us, are human. What they did is violate those inalienable rights that everybody has. To which if I'm the defense lawyer, I'm saying, oh yeah, where'd you get them? Who gave you inalienable rights? Don't tell me it's the U.S. Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That doesn't apply in Germany. If we wanted to be Americans, we'd live here. Don't you come on. How do you, Justice Jackson, write the laws that convict us when those laws didn't even exist before we did it. That's like me driving 40 miles an hour down the 40 mile an hour road to get here. And someone writing me a ticket. Why are you writing me a ticket? Well, we've changed the speed limit to 20 miles an hour. When did you do that? Five minutes ago. In fact, we're going to write you a ticket for every day for the last 10 years. What? 
But Jackson's able to make the argument and the argument sticks about inalienable rights, about there being evil, about there being inhuman conduct, because that's what those who believe that there is an absolute right and an absolute wrong and a God who is out there who sets that standard, that's what we're able to say. You give me a jury who believes in God, I can't walk any of these people. But you give me the right jury and I might can. So how do we explain the immorality of Hitler? I've asked my my internet email friend, how do you decide what's right and wrong? See, his gut's already given me Hitler was wrong. So once his gut's given me that, I might have trouble if I find someone who says, oh, no, I think Hitler was a great guy and we ought to do that. But I have yet to find anyone who will truly voice a belief like that. I promise you their lives don't reflect it. Because they'd be the first ones to jump up and down if you said, fine, uh, I, I think you need to be castrated because you're not tall enough. You're genetic inferior. Let's at least zap you with radiation so you can't reproduce and mess up the human race. Do you really think these people who might even give it lip service would agree to that? No. And if they do, they're crazy. <laughs> so how are right and wrong assist? Is, is right and wrong decided, whoops, I've already marked that one out, by what works to assist society? Well, if it helps the greater good, then it's good and it's right. Well, what do you mean by helps? Helps what? Makes us happy? Do you really want your life determined by what makes the most people happy? What if it's a 51-49? Do you really want to be in the 49% of what makes most people happy? Do you want to say, well, no, it's not. It's what advances society. What do you mean by advance? One person's advance is another person's retreat. I've met a lot of people who think we need more granola <laughs> and less genetically modified crops. And I've met a lot of people who think that if we don't have genetically modified crops, we'll never feed the masses. Who's going to decide what assists society? The elite? Do we really want corporate America making these decisions for us? Do we want the auto manufacturer to decide whether or not human beings are worth spending an extra 50 cents on the ignition so it doesn't shut the car off in the middle of the drive? And we have no say-so in that? Do we leave that to those decision makers? Maybe, my friend says, it's not what works to assist society, but it's what works to assist an individual. What makes it better for me? Well, I want to tell you one of the things that makes it better for me. I've got a friend who has a car I really, really like. And it would make it much better for me if I took it. I suspect you have friends and enemies who have things that would make your life much better if you took them. Is it free for all time? They say, well, no, 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 that's anarchy. And once you start taking things, then the, it's going to be a breakdown of society and it's not going to be good for anyone. And that's how the debate goes on. And then you say, okay, how about if I can take them without nobody knowing it? It's morally correct because nobody knows it. Let me go a step further. If it's what works to assist society or what works to assist an individual, I've got an individual who is truly starving to death. I can find you a number of malnourished people. Did you know when people die, a lot of times they're buried? A lot of times they're cremated? Yet they'd be a delicious source of protein. So if we really want our morality to be what works to assist society and what works to assist an individual, maybe 
We should just pass a law that says when anybody dies, let's divide up their body and use it for food. That's gross. Okay, use it to feed pigs, then we'll eat the pigs. Nobody's serious about that. Nobody's really going to do that. That's a breakdown of society. How? You can tell people they were cremated. Here's some ashes. When really you just pull the ashes out of a fireplace, what are they going to do? Run DNA? Take the bodies and use them for fertilizer. There are lots of ways we can use them to assist. There's no dignity in a human being once they're dead. They're just a collection of cells that are rotting. You know, maybe it's uh, what certain people think. That's how you decide right and wrong. Well, heaven save us from that one. Yeah, all you need is a snapshot of Washington, D.C. to decide how good we are at getting people together to think about something. I had this argument with a friend of my son's who's an ethicist from Oxford, and this is the new avant-garde theory, in my opinion. Right and wrong just exist in the universe. We can't explain it. It's like math. It's built into the fabric of things. Two plus two is four. It's wrong to kill people. Well, that's a stunning idea. What do you say to the person who says two plus two is four and it's right to kill people? What do you say to Adolf Hitler, two plus two is four, but hey, the final solution's a pretty good one? Say, well, I disagree. On what basis? Two plus two is four? Uh, that doesn't do it either. Maybe... It's whatever God commanded. God said it's wrong to kill people, so it's wrong to kill people. Now, if you get into this discussion with an ethicist, it gets really fun really fast. Because they start to talk to you about something that we will call Euthyphro's Dilemma. Oops, there we go. Do it right. That's it better. Euthyphro's Dilemma. What is Euthyphro's Dilemma, you say? Maybe some of you know Euthyphro's Dilemma. We'll throw it up on the chalkboard. Euthyphro's Dilemma. Now, this is really good. You can know it. I'm going to give you two sources for Euthyphro's Dilemma. First source, Plato. Plato wrote the story of Euthyphro and Socrates. It's a marvelous story. Socrates is headed to court where he's going to be tried for corrupting the youth of Athens. So here with Socrates, you've got an old man who's accused of corrupting the young people. And along the way to court, he runs across a fellow named Euthyphro. You're thinking, that's a goofy name. You're right. That name comes together from three different Greek words. You, which means good. The, or, and the euthyphro, is, they would say the, euthyphro, the the part, is the root of God, theos. Good, God, fro. Froreo means to guard. Fro is a root that means to guard or to judge. Not in the sense of crene, but in a different sense. So you've got now Euthyphro. He's the man who's going to guard the goodness of God to Socrates. And he's actually a young guy. Euthyphro's a young fella, and he's headed to court because he's trying to corrupt the old people. Namely, he wants his dad killed. He says to Socrates, why are you going to court? Socrates says, uh, 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 he says, who are you suing? Socrates says, I'm not suing anybody. Well, why are you going to court? Well, actually, I'm being uh, indicted. What are you being indicted for? Corrupting the young people. Why are you going? Oh, because I'm a young person and I'm trying to get my dad killed. Why? Because my dad's an evil fellow. What did your dad do? Well, he killed someone. Really? Was there a justification? Well, he thinks there was and he starts telling the story. And Socrates says to Euthyphro, he says, well, why are you saying what your dad did was wrong? 
He says, because the gods say it's wrong. And Socrates says, well, who decides what right and wrong is? Oh, the gods do. Socrates says, but the gods disagree about that sometimes. Well, yeah, that's true. So what makes something right? Well, it's the things that all the gods agree on. What do all the gods agree on? Well, I don't know. Well, how do you know what your father did was wrong? And the whole dialogue just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And finally it ends with, with the, the, the Euthyphro saying, well, good is whatever God uh, uh, approves of and says is good, the gods. And so Socrates says this, is God good? Actually, he says it a little bit differently. But uh, I put it into a little easier to understand English. He says, is that which is holy loved by the gods because it's holy? Or is it holy because it's loved by the gods? Okay, now if you're in a brain twister over this, don't worry about it. We'll pick back up in a minute. But it's mean, is God good because he does good? Or is good whatever God says it is? Is God simply a messenger? So is God just a really good person? And if good, God is good because he does good, then good trumps God. But if, God is, if good is just what God says, then God's just a messenger. Either way, your God's inadequate. And that's Euthyphro's dilemma. Now, I know what you're saying. Give me another example. So I did. I believe that's Jay-Z on the right and Kanye West on the left. Here's the song. I've cut it down to 30 seconds. read their ancient philosophy. <laughs> is pious pious because God loves pious? Is good good because God loves it? Socrates wants to know whose bias you're holding here and Plato wrote it up so all for Plato screech. And I'm sure at their concerts people go wild at that point. It's a legitimate question. What makes right, right, and what makes wrong, wrong? Is it just because God says it? Or does God say it because it is and God's doing it? Can we minimize God to being either a messenger or a slave to a certain morality? Well, I don't think that's the Christian worldview. And I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. And I don't think that's what the Bible indicates uh, when it talks about right and wrong. I think Plato's problem was he had inadequate gods. Euthyphro, Socrates, Plato, inadequate gods. They were just kind of humans on steroids. By vitamin B12 shots. Human growth hormones. The biblical answer is that good is what reflects God's character. That God is a moral being. That God actually has morality about him. That God is truth, not lie. That God is love. That God is light, not darkness. God is not light. As a messenger carrying light, God is light. God is a moral being. And what that God as a moral being has as the fabric of his morality is what we call good. Good is not good because God does it. Good is good because it's who God is. We are made in his image. 
And so deep within the core of us, it resonates on what good is. We don't have to, to sit there and, and, and try to find a law to figure out what good is. We just need to know God. So is it whatever God commanded and God just set up arbitrary laws or is it? No. Right and wrong are decided. It is what God's character is. That's right and wrong. So how do we explain the immorality of Hitler? Hitler was immoral and Hitler was wrong because Hitler did not recognize and appreciate the dignity of human beings made in the image of God. Hitler did not treat people with the dignity and respect they have, inherent because God made them in his image. And everything within us cries out, that's wrong because it is. And we can argue things. And we can say, no, 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 that's not why it's wrong. Because we don't want to accept the truth that there's a God out there who's moral. But if we don't accept that, our piece of the puzzle just isn't going to fit right. It doesn't matter which perspective we're coming up with. If it's anything less than an objective moral God, I'll argue you till the cows come home, but you give me an independent juror who shares your perspective, and I'll walk Hitler every time. And it's, it's a frustrating problem that philosophers know about. Oh, they'll argue uh, a, a positivistic ethic. Okay, we don't have any basis for it, but let's just all agree this is going to be wrong. It just doesn't work. A real moral God is the peace that makes most sense of things. It's the right shape. It's the right color. It's the right fabric. It explains that deep part of us that cries out at injustice because justice is moral and injustice is not. And you may be thinking, you know, injustice doesn't bother me. Come on. You drive a car, you get cut off by someone who doesn't wait in the line five minutes to exit and they just pull up at the last minute and cut in. It bothers you. <laughs> that visceral gut reaction of, that's not right. Because I've seen you wave your finger at me when I do it. <laughs> what puzzle piece fits most? What makes the best sense of things? It's a real moral God. I go into more detail in that chapter, and I've got a number of other chapters that go with it too. But the idea behind this book was Christianity makes the most sense of the puzzle pieces that all of us have as we've put together a world view, as whether we do it consciously or not. What explains the way we truly feel the world is? What explains best our sense of of right and wrong, what explains best our sense of love, our sense of dignity and honor? That's a part of it. You all have been most kind. We have Q&A coming up, but um, I believe my time is finished for this. And uh, uh, thank you guys very much for being so kind and attentive. <laughs>